the Gen Z audience is extremely, extremely loyal, right? They don't want to just be fed information for the sake of it. They don't want to be fed a commercial just for the sake of a commercial. They want to feel that authenticity. They need that authenticity, right? And so we worked with an influencer who she was a content creator, but she was always traveling. She was on the go. She was always going to new places and she always needed to, you know, stay aware of her emails. But at the same time, she, you know, she took a video, she needed to edit it. She needed to get it out to, you know, a partnership that she was working on. So what we did is we put this product in her hand and in so many ways, it was almost like a day in the life of it. So think of it that way. So this particular influencer, she's she's creating her content, her videos, her whatever, and she's using our device in her videos. This, this is a mm. YouTube influencer, and so I think this was, ended up being a 17, 18, 20-minute video because these are the types of videos that she was always putting out anyway. So her audience was looking for this from her. Welcome back to Generation Influence, a podcast focusing on the movers and shakers working behind the scenes in influencer marketing and e-commerce. I'm your host, Bill Hildebolt, one of the co-founders of Gen Video, a leading platform in the influencer marketing space focused on advanced analytics and e-commerce outcomes. So today we've got a special treat. Some of you may have seen the episode with Tiffany Mockle, who had spent time at Lenovo. She mentioned that the mentor that had been meant the most to her and done the most for her in her career was Kevin Bremis. Today's guest is that very same Kevin Bremis. So this is a first on the show. And as you can also tell, I was so impressed by Tiffany's description of Kevin that I decided to try to be like Kevin and have adopted his haircut and even his color of shirt. We absolutely coordinated this in advance. Kevin's a brand marketer who has spent the bulk of his career in consumer electronics marketing and has a ton of stories he's going to tell about working in that space. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Tell us a bit about your career path and what you're up to currently. No, I appreciate it, Bill. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is my first time doing anything like this, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit that outright. Uh, I'm really excited, though, to have the opportunity to, to talk to you. And yeah, I, I, you know, I worked with Tiffany um, for a couple different years at, at Lenovo, and uh, I'm sure we'll get into some of that story. But uh, yeah, as far as, you know, what I've kind of done over the course of my career, I, I think it's a little bit of an interesting journey. You know, really kind of a, a third, a third, a third is how I really kind of uh, look at it. I was, a, I was a product manager for about a third of my career. I was a, an account manager, business development manager for about a third of my career. And then about a third of that, I was also in the, in the product marketing, retail and brand marketing space. So that was kind of my, my marketing piece, if you will. And, um, you know, really just working for some large technology brands. Um, and I think that's kind of where my heart is. I'm kind of a gadgety guy, kind of a hands-on technology kind of guy. So those things really kind of excite me, but working for some big brand names like Intel, uh, Lenovo, uh, I was even spent some time in the, uh, in the printing space back when printing was cool uh, with Lexmark. Uh, and then I even worked at Underwriters Laboratories. Uh, uh, so many people might've seen the, the UL in a circle that's on the back of their product. And, and this was a professional services testing uh, organization, 100 labs around the world that they have. But in that case, I was still connected to the retail and the consumer space helping retailers to bring private brand goods to market, right? So it was just, uh, I've, it's always kind of been the area that I've been in uh, for the majority of my career uh, until now. Uh, recently, I'm only a few months in uh, transparently, but I'm now working at EY, uh, Ernst & Young, for those who might know that name, but I'm working in the uh, professional services B2B side of things. So we can talk about that transition from consumer to B2B, but it's a new journey and new opportunity for me and, and what I'm, in, I'm really starting to enjoy so far. That is great. What a wealth and breadth and depth of experience. Hopefully we'll get to dive into all of that. Let's maybe start, uh, since it is the overlap with Tiffany at Lenovo. And, you know, one of the things we talked about with her and, but would love to hear your take on it. So Lenovo was really building its brand for at least the beginning uh, a, a time when you were there. So tell us about some of the specific things you guys did as you thought about building a new brand in the cutthroat competitive space of consumer electronics. Sure. No, I, I, there's a lot, I have a lot of stories I could share, but uh, really the, the reality is when I, I joined Lenovo back in 2012 and uh, I, I'd, I'd lived in Chicago for 10 years, had this opportunity to move to North Carolina to, to one of Lenovo's co-headquarters in, in the Morrisville uh, Raleigh area, really. 
And, you know, at that time when I moved there, uh, I was specifically on the North America retail marketing team. And, you know, Lenovo today is, is a bit of a more, uh, more of a household name. It, it's many people may not know. It's actually the largest PC manufacturer in the world. Um, they do more than PCs. They're in servers. They're in, you know, AI. They're in all those areas. But the reality is, is when I started at Lenovo back in 2012, um, we were very much a, a challenger brand. Um, you know, they may have been the, the number one, uh, you know, market share in, in India or in China, but, you know, in the United States and North America specifically, uh, it, we were number five, number six. I mean, we were way down that list behind wow. HP, Dell, you know, all those guys. And so, you know, I, I just kind of remember walking in there, been there for a couple months and um, I got this email, this invitation, and, and I went and talked to one of the sales leaders and he, he just said, you know, you've been here for three months, I think it was at the time. He said, congratulations, you're now on the launch team for a brand new product that's entering the market. This was when two-in-one convertible PCs were just entering the market. They, they were not yet a thing. Uh, this was back when Windows 8 was launching with Microsoft. Uh, there was investments from Intel. All, everybody was kind of was surrounding this new convertible, you know, four-mode laptop that frankly, today in 2023 is, is mainstream. And so, you know, I, I joined this team, only been there a couple months and was put onto this launch team. And we launched the Lenovo Yoga, which, you know, became for enough for a, for quite some time, a, a the number one convertible PC uh, in the world. Um, but the reality is, is we were a challenger brand launching this new product, great opportunity, but nobody knew in North America, especially who this brand was, what is this product? It's brand new, never seen such a thing before. Is it even necessary? You think of a laptop that converts to a tablet, right? This was a whole brand new thing. And so we not only were trying to build our brand, we were trying to launch a new product that nobody had seen before. So there's a lot of challenges around that, but uh, we launched it exclusively at Best Buy. And, uh, you know, really, as they say, the, the rest is history. Um, you, you could walk into a store today and you'll see them everywhere. But uh, the reality is it was a kind of a really fun, interesting, challenging, and in some ways scary type of situation, but uh, one that kind of kicked things off uh, and my love for, for technology was definitely uh, well suited. I, there's a couple of things I want to unpack there. One thing is I think, you know, for a lot of folks in brand marketing, the idea, and especially on the CPG side, right? P and G has this philosophy that they're going to be number one or number two in a market, or they're going to get out. And I think a lot of brands, even, you know, not, not everybody's the size of P and G, but I think a lot of North American publicly traded manufacturing companies have that same philosophy that if they can't win in a certain market, right, they're going to, they're going to move and find markets where they can win. So when you're number five or number six, I'm sort of curious, do you look at number four and go like, okay, let's go one step at a time. Let's, let's look at those guys, see if we can knock them off and just move up peg by peg. Or do you feel like the idea is like, no, What's number one doing and what can we do to pivot and shift and skate and get there quickly to that number one or two slot? Like, how did you guys think about it? Was it incrementality or was it take big swings? It was more the big swing uh, perspective, I think. I mean, the, the reality is, is, you know, as, as leaders, when we're talking to our executives, we're putting our KPIs in place, we're putting our annual plans, our business plans together, you know, what do you, what do you want to say? Right. You want to swing for the fences. You know, we're, we're striving to be number two, to be number one. Right. And so many people are concerned about if I don't say big things, then they're not, then they think I'm not taking it seriously. But the reality is, is of course we were striving to be, you know, as big as we could to be the leader. And in the, the reality is, is that things kind of fall where they fall. Right. In our business plans, our annual plan, we want to be number two, we want to be number three, we want to be number one. I, I don't look at it as I want to knock off number four, or number five, what's immediately ahead of me, what's who's immediately ahead of me. But what I am trying to do is I'm trying to sell my product to the right audience. I'm trying to create that great customer experience. You know, what is my value proposition? What is the product that I want to put into that consumer's hands? Because at the end of the day, I may have the best product that was ever made, but if I put it into the wrong hands of the wrong person, they're going to have a terrible experience. They're not going to tell their friends, their peers. They're not going to tell, you know, Gen Zers may not tell their parents. They may not recommend that product. And so the reality is, is, you know, of course, I want to be as high and as big as I can. I want to sell as many of the products as I can, but I want to have that great consumer customer experience. I'm going to have the right product is going to meet the needs of that customer and what they're trying to achieve. You know, they need, you know, a, a large screen. They need high resolution. They need powerful processors. They need long battery life because they're a mobile type of person. 
the reality is that I want to put that product in their hands and, and for them to have the best experience. I do believe that things will fall where they fall. Now, if I want to accelerate and, you know, I want to really knock down or, you know, knock down others and move up in market share quickly, sure, I can do some, pull some levers like, you know, promotional plans. I can discount the product. I can do, you know, other things like that. But at the end of the day, is that affecting my margins, right? Is that really the, the right thing to do? So kind of the long story short is um, I'm taking big swings. Yes, it's nice to see number five, number four kind of tick off. I'm shooting for the top spot as much as I can, but I think those things just kind of fall naturally. Um, and, and it really just comes down to, uh, you know, what happens and how you, how you adjust, right? I mean, we're always kind of moving and shaking as they say, especially in the marketing side of things. And then on top of that is if I'm asking for more money because I want to go bigger with my campaign, I'm kind of tin cupping it sometimes as we have to do in the marketing space. Um, you know, what is my ROI on the, on those, um, campaigns that I'm putting into market? So it's really kind of all those things in one. To get back to your original question, um, I, I don't really go, yes, I knocked off number five. Well, that's great, but I'm not stopping there. So uh, again, big swings is probably the best way to, to, to best way to put it. All right, let's go even a little bit deeper there. So I want to think about that yoga positioning. And so Lenovo kind of came out of a B2B world. If it, you know, if it, if it had a reputation, it was with people, business users that, you know, understood that the brand had been bought from IBM, was known for being, you know, best in class ThinkPads, best in class business laptops and business compute. When you thought about yoga, were you, was that basically saying, here are the needs that we know a business audience would have. Here's, we, here's how we can adapt them into a consumer, a consumer market or a consumer offering with the yoga or was it a little bit more like, well, this is not a product that we think naturally fits in the in the business market, but it is our big chance to address what we think pain points are for consumers. I'm just sort of wondering, again, that question of was it adaptive or was it disruptive, if you will, in terms of a product offering? Yeah, I think I think absolutely disruptive. Uh, the, the reality is, again, our our. Our history, as exactly as you said, the ThinkPad was bought from from IBM, and that was the heritage, right, at the, at the time. And so many people had heard of ThinkPad, they'd never heard of Lenovo. And and I'm not going to ignore the fact that there were opportunities where we might have said, you know, uh, the Lenovo, the makers of ThinkPad, right? Because I mean, you do have to make that connection at times, especially as you're trying to build your brand brand credibility uh, in a uh, in a what was a new market for for Lenovo in North America, and so. Um, you know, but but the truth is, is that we were launching this new product that had its own value proposition. Now, for those kind of behind the scenes or under, you know, might have had you know some awareness that there there were some design characteristics in there that you know came from from the think side. That that would make sense, right? You want to take your strengths and bring them in, but at the same time, we didn't want to pass off that product as a ThinkPad, right? It it had its own name, its own place, its own positioning, and so. Um, there were some connectivities there in terms of maybe trying to build credibility around the brand Lenovo, but as far as the yoga, the product itself, it had its own place and it was very disruptive to the market. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's even to this day, you know, you think about, you know, Apple that's out there today, they don't, they don't have convertible PCs. They've stuck in, in their lane. Um, they, they don't have touchscreens on, on their MacBook products, but, uh, the, the, again, we had a specific uh, lane that we wanted to stay in with our product. We had a specific customer that we were going for and going after. Again, it was extremely disruptive, and and it was even it was quite challenging even at the very beginning. Um, you know, getting it off, getting it off the, you know, getting it started and and get it off the the the, the pad, if you will. But the, the truth is, is once it started going, once people started to understand that product. Uh, we had a lot of alliance marketing uh, help, if you will, from Microsoft and Intel. And so all these investments were going around this product and, you know, really what could it bring to the consumer and, and what was it, the, how it was beneficial to them. Of course, there were some doubts, I'll even say in my mind, you know, can this really work or, or is it, are consumers just too used to that, that traditional laptop? But uh, I'd, I'd say if you look at uh, where it is today and, and, and all the retailers uh, or the predominantly at, at Best Buy. There's some versions of it that are available online, if you will, but uh, I'd say it's been extremely successful. And, and I think it just passed its uh, at last year in 2022 uh, was its 10 year anniversary. So it's still out there, still going strong. Uh, I'm not there now, but uh, it's still fun to kind of see, see it succeed in the market because I know I had something to do with that launch. 
Let's dig into part of that success was the partnership with Best Buy. So as many people might know, there's lots of individual SKUs that may be, uh, may be exclusive to this retailer or that retailer, but to launch basically an all new product through an exclusive partnership feels like it might have been a very risky and controversial decision uh, within Lenovo. You guys did it, obviously worked, 10 year anniversary speaks to it, but uh, that also feels very bold to me. Did you guys feel like that was bold? Again, there is, as you said, there's tons of partnerships and alliance marketing that occurs in CE. We talk a lot about to Tiffany about that, but this still feels like a very bold move to me. And I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, how you guys thought about it. Um, does that kind of partnership, you know, today, if you could do it again, do you think that would still make sense? Or if the, as the industry shifted in some ways where that wouldn't be anything anybody would do now? No, I, I think, look, it, it obviously worked. Um, and the, the truth is, is that we needed to partner with um, the, the biggest opportunity that was, that was out there. And so, you know, we, we, it was launched at, at Best Buy. There have been stints of it um, where, you know, Lenovo has maybe tried to veer away from that and tried to, you know, grow it in other parts of retail. But the reality is that partnership is is rock solid. Again, it, based on my, my history there, I guess I'm not there today. So I'm not speaking in terms of their current relationship. But I, I know when I was there, uh, and I was there for two different times at Lenovo. I was there, I left to go do a few other things in my career, and I came back. So uh, but in both of those instances, in both of my tenures at the company, uh, I, I managed that marketing relationship with, with Best Buy, so the marketing side of that. And we needed to partner with the, the biggest one out there, and, and of course we did. And there's a lot of things involved in that relationship. They were extremely, extremely su successful. Obviously, they can turn the most and have been successful at turning the most volume in the market. They're, they're, a, they're a leader in their space. They have a, a really strong credibility. Their blue shirts are top notch and people go there specifically to, for advisement, right? Tell me what I need, right? So as a consumer, I don't know what computer I need. I just know that I need one. I walk in that door, I find a blue shirt, walk me through this process. What's the best product for my needs? And so again, there was a lot of things going on in the back end of that relationship that had to do with the training of blue shirts to help them understand you know, how to sell the product, how to match it up with the right consumer. At Lenovo, we had our own field team that was in there. And so they were not only helping to do assisted sales to consumers, they were also um, working on those relationships with blue shirts. So all those things were happening from a more tactical perspective in the store. But then direct, beyond that is that what we were doing at the headquarters level. And so oftentimes, I, I, this is this is me. I, I'm not sure if everybody agrees th with this, but I, I do think it's a successful tactic that I think is worth trying. If you're launching new products, if you're trying to really gain credibility, I think it's a great thing to try to build your brand through a retailer and direct to consumer. DTC is extremely important. There's lots of benefits to taking your product directly to the consumer. There's improved, increased margins uh, and, and those types of things. There's additional brand opportunities and awareness and consideration that come with that. So there is absolutely a lane for direct to consumer. Um, however, in, in the world of, of PC and technology and you know working with a leader like a Best Buy, work in the sense that we not only wanted to put the product on the shelf, that's one thing, um, but at the same time, we wanted to really promote that relationship. We wanted to really elevate our brand. And, you know, and, and I'm not saying anything that's out of line, use Best Buy, work with Best Buy to promote and elevate and escalate our brand. It's a significant um, credibility statement when you work with a retailer like that. And and again, I've done the same thing at, at Walmart. I've done the same thing at Costco and, and other retailers. So it's not just a Best Buy thing, but that was the opportunity for that product where it made a lot of sense. And so the thing is, is that you know if, if Best Buy has this reputation for the best technology, for the best advisement, and they're really getting the right product in the consumer's hands, for them to say, this is the product you need. This is the best thing for you. This will fit your need. That was a big credibility statement. And again, when we're, we were a challenger brand and kind of coming up you know, through the ranks, if you will, um, it, it's one of those where we at Lenovo didn't want to say, hey, trust me, I'm telling you, trust our partner, trust this retailer who's, who's already getting the right technology in the right people's hands. And so if Best Buy um, recommends and, and you know, that product and continues to expand the assortment underneath the Yoga sub brand name, um, that all in all, those are the best things to do. And then even beyond that, again, 
DTC, extremely important. Lenovo continues to this day and in the past especially was promoting directly to consumers to, to elevate the brand and raise awareness for it. We, were also, we also started at one point making some pretty significant investments through Best Buy to take part in their brand campaigns or their promotional, their seasonal brand and promotional campaigns. So around back to school holiday, uh, today seems like there's always a campaign going on, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, dads and grads, you know, you know, at the time of graduation, moving up into back to school or whether it's July 4th or it's President's Day or, you know, Black Friday, there's always a campaign going on. But we, we invested significantly in those key drive times uh, as a way to not only promote the product with good promotions, of course, but at the same time, bring our brand to the forefront. And, uh, you know, whether it was back when TV was cool, uh, we, we did some TV campaigns with them, but uh, everything nowadays has moved to online, um, you know, digital video, programmatic, you know, display campaigns, social, all those things. So uh, those are some things that we did that were really pretty big before uh, I, I left Lenovo. And uh, again, I think all that is really just, just been a part of that journey and, and that growth of that sub brand and quite frankly, the overall Lenovo brand in North America. What a great anecdote. I think the, the idea of, uh, again, you were working at a large brand. I mean, yes, it was a challenger brand at the time, but we're still talking about a global manufacturer having the perspective of drafting off the credibility of your retail partner, whereas I feel like so many times those relationships between the retailer and the manufacturer tend to be fraught with this perception of, you know, differing interests and, and differing agendas. And so it's sort of this tense you know, what are they going to ask me for? What am I willing to do? And you just spun that uh, around on its head and looked at it completely differently. What can they do for me? What can I benefit from them? Sure, there's going to be an ask on my side, but, you know, <laughs> in theory, we should probably be pretty aligned. We all want the same thing, which is to sell a boatload of product, which Absolutely. you guys very successfully did. And I, I have to imagine that that perspective you brought to it was a big part of that success. And so before we leave Lenovo, I, I think, and maybe this was a little bit more in your second stint there, you did some influencer marketing as well. So sure. speaking of uh, co-opting the interests and figuring out where interests are aligned and telling a, you know, a mutually beneficial story, can you tell us a little bit about uh, where you found uh, influencer marketing success in your time at Lenovo? Yeah, uh, two things actually come to mind. So um, I, I will mention this. So um, in that second time period when I was at Lenovo. So this was, I had returned in what, 2019. Uh, I was there for about three years at that point. And so this was when Gen Z marketing really started to, to take off, right? It was, it was, you know, this was the first generation that had grown up with technology in their hands, right? And so um, some of my first influencer campaigns, and now I'll get to a second one, were actually with Best Buy. I, I remember they came to us and we actually piloted a program uh, the first time they'd done it, and it was with a, uh, a Gen Z influencer, and we it was it was brand new to me. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not Gen Z. You could probably tell that pretty easily. Uh, and and reality is, I'm what what, what do they call them? Zenials, right? So I'm at the end of Gen X, at the very beginning of uh, millennials. So uh, the truth be told, there's a lot to learn from from my perspective now. My 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 girls, my my young daughters, they would they would laugh at me now, but. Uh, the truth is, is we had done some, uh, we had kicked off and kind of piloted a, an influencer program with Best Buy. Uh, they brought to us. And so there was a lot of key learnings, I think, on both sides. But we really found an opportunity to, you know, get our product out there in the hands of an influencer and really reach that audience. And so, again, in, the, in those couple of years that I, was, that I stayed at the company, um, that second time around, we, we continued to do those influencer campaigns. And so, again, it was just a way, a, a kind of a credibility to, to put the product into the hands of um, someone that the Gen Z audience was interested in learning and seeing and, and hearing from. Um, so again, that was a bit of a credibility statement. But an another example, um, and we've done that around the yoga product line, but um, another example when I, was, when I was at Lenovo, and this was a little bit before I left, but uh, we worked with, with your organization with, um, with um, Gen Dot Video and did an influencer campaign for the launch of a detachable laptop. And mm -hmm. so, we had worked with a uh, one of the large uh, telecommunications carriers to to launch a a connected laptop. Right today, everybody's used to you know I've got my laptop, I've got to find Wi-Fi, you know that 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 type of thing. And they they use their phones, sometimes tablets, but they use their phones for more of that on-the-go mobility 
um, type of scenario. Um, but and then, but when I have my laptop, you know, so many people they go to a coffee shop, they're at the airport, they connect to Wi-Fi. We were launching a product. It was a detachable laptop, so it's like a big tablet with a keyboard on it. But it was full power laptop, and so we. The idea behind that was this was kind of new to the market. I think even to this day, it's still some of the uh, some of the reach is, is still maybe a little bit struggling. I think it, it you know getting consumers to really latch onto that. But the opportunity was, hey, I'm a mobile user. I'm always on the go, whether it's in business or whether I'm a student, and I need to connect and do emails, and I need to do things that are not not so easy on my on my phone, right? I need a larger screen. I need to do some creating of content. And so maybe even some editing of video or whatever. So the reality is, is that taking a laptop that is always connected to the cellular network was really a big deal. But what are the things that come along with that, right? So you need to have power. You need to have a laptop that has enough power to it that you can work on those large files, have multiple windows open. You need to have a long battery life, right? The last thing you want to do is, you know, your, your laptop dies after two hours. So that's, that's a terrible thing. Another big benefit was, you know, having cellular connectivity was great from a security perspective, right? Inconvenience, I don't have to find a Wi-Fi network, but now it's always connected. My emails and everything in the background is always connecting. So what we did was taking this product that was kind of new to the market, the adoption rate wasn't big. It was kind of launching, you know, new. And we worked with an influencer with Gen.Video to find an influencer that was a, a content creator. And the goal or the what we were trying to accomplish here was we didn't want this just to be a paid partnership. We didn't want it to just be a commercial. Um, the Gen Z audience is extremely, extremely loyal, right? They they don't want to just be fed information for the sake of it. They don't want to be fed a commercial just for the sake of a commercial. They want to feel that authenticity. They need that authenticity, right? And so we worked with an influencer who she was a content creator, but she was always traveling. She was on the go. She was always going to new places and she always needed to, you know, stay aware of her emails. But at the same time, she, you know, she took a video, she needed to edit it. She needed to get it out to, you know, a partnership that she was working on. So what we did is we put this product in her hand and in so many ways, it was almost like a day in the life of So think of it that way. So this particular influencer, she's, she's creating her content, her videos her whatever, and she's using our device in her video. She's, this is a mm -hmm. YouTube influencer. And so I think this would end up being a 17, 18, 20 minute video. And because these are the types of videos that she was always putting out anyway. So her audience was looking for this from her content creation, how to, how to do this, how to do that. So they were already looking to her for that type of content. We slid the product in, if you will. And in this particular uh, edition of her episode of her video, she was using our product. So those who may not have been overly astute to or you know notice what was going on may not even recognize she wasn't using her trusty whatever laptop. She was using our device. And then at the end of that 20 minute video where she had showed how to edit videos and how to create this content and she was always on the go. She didn't have to look for Wi-Fi or go to a coffee shop. Then you maybe had a little bit of that kind of that record scratch. You know, let me now let me tell you what device I'm using. You may not have realized. And so I've told you all these things. I've given you some information and some knowledge and you know, this is to my audience of millions of folks that are already looking to me for this type of information. And now I'm just going to say, I, I hope you found this information useful, this content useful. Let me just do a quick little plug. It's a paid sponsorship. Everybody gets that, but a quick little plug for this device that I used. Maybe it's something you want to use. Maybe it's not, but I just want to let you know about my experience. And so we didn't lead with the product. We didn't lead with the brand. We didn't make it a commercial throughout the entire video. We let her create her content as she was normally going to do it on her other laptop anyway. And then at the end, she was able to say, I hope you enjoyed it. Here's the device I was using. I would highly recommend it for all these reasons. Um, but again, it was more authentic. It wasn't just meant to be a commercial in your face for 30 seconds or two minutes. It was a, I'm going to feed you my content anyway. And then I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. It really did work. Um, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of reach and engagement with that content. The, the, the comments from that uh, content on the influencers uh, YouTube page and, and other areas uh, social were, were very positive. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize they could get a powerful laptop that was always connected, but uh, you know, it, it, I think it did its job. Uh, there were a lot of key learnings that came from that, but it was a successful campaign. And, you know, again, thanks to Jim video for that. Cause I think we had a, we had a really successful launch of that product and uh, it's, it's the best of my knowledge is still out there today. I love that. That is, that is truly the definition of authenticity is finding an influencer that meets your audience needs, letting them do their thing and then letting them, you know, communicate the message. And, 
you don't, you know, in working with a content creator, you're absolutely right. Part of that audience is looking for the tools that that content creator is using so that they can emulate them. So what a great fit. What a great story. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Let's jump quickly to Intel. Just, I do think it's kind of interesting. The, the cooperation, again, the alliance marketing that occurs between the OEMs, the manufacturers of the, you know, the end consumer devices and a partner like an Intel or a Microsoft. So any particular lessons kind of come out from that time, you know, as you think about brand marketing and, you know, maybe the difference between, again, a component versus the OEM, but actually how they kind of work together symbiotically in the best of all worlds. Yeah, that's, that's always an interesting relationship because, you know, being at the OEM, um, whether that's Lenovo or really any large brand that has these ingredient brands, uh, and in this case, Intel, but there was other, you know, other competitors, AMD, Google, Microsoft, right? There's always, those relationships are always happening. So, you know, but each of them, uh, and, uh, you know, each of those alliance partners have their own value proposition. They have their own um, agenda, for lack of a better word. And so those relationships are critically important. It's so important to build strong relationships and have a really direct understanding of what each of you are trying to accomplish. You know, not to not to beat that horse, but you know, at Lenovo, we wanted to sell as many products as possible, the entirety of the computer, right? Intel wants to sell a specific model computer because it has because it has their processor in it or their graphics card in it. And just really working very closely to to, to say, look. The, mo the more product I'm able to sell that has your um, component within it, obviously that benefits both of us from a revenue perspective. So that's one thing. At the same time, I understand you're making investments. We're partnering together. And so you want to promote your brand, right? You don't want to just put money into a promotional campaign and not talk about your brand. And so um, when I was at Lenovo or quite frankly, I went to Intel. And so now it's on the other side of the table. So I've seen both sides of this, this coin. Um, it, it's just one of those things that, um, you got, you have to stay close. You have to understand what each are trying to accomplish. You just have to work closely and find those compromise opportunities. those compromise moments that where you can elevate the brand wherever possible. And sometimes you just got to sell product. And, you know, again, at the same time, you think about a, a laptop and it's got a, you know, palm rest sticker on there. So if you open up your laptop today, you might see an Intel sticker, an AMD sticker, or whatever the case may be. That's kind of their ongoing efforts of promoting their brand as a, as a component. But uh, truth be told is I'll give you one, actually one other example. So when I would run some of those campaigns with, with a Best Buy, um, so you think of it as a, a holiday campaign that's happening at Best Buy. So Best Buy is selling product. They're promoting their brand. Well, I'm at Lenovo and I'm trying to sell my product, but I also want to mention my brand. Well, then you have Intel who also may be partnering in there and they want to promote their brand. So not, it's not just about Best Buy or Lenovo. It's Best Buy, Lenovo, Intel, and we're all trying to get our message out there. And so those were some of the most challenging, but I'll also say fun moments in some of my tech career is the, the opportunity to work with these large powerhouse brands, find ways to collaborate and, and really just compromise and, and promote all of our brands, promote our products, get as many out there. But at the end of the day, having that good consumer experience is absolutely critical because if you put the wrong product or a bad product in the wrong person's hands, I, I can't remember. I don't remember the exact statistics, but you know, it takes forever to promote and build your brand, and it takes mm -hmm. about two seconds for you to tear it down. So you got to keep that in the back of your mind, no matter what you're doing. Authenticity is important. You know, being direct and getting the right product in the hands of the consumer is incredibly important for obvious reasons. Uh, be because again, it it takes about two seconds to destroy your brand, and so we we just worked closely together. The, those alliance relationships critically important. They are to this day, and I'm, I'm aware of that. And and, uh, and in fact, I'm still doing some alliance marketing, even at EY, that I'm sure we can touch on momentarily. But uh, just uh, it was a, it was a good, challenging time, and uh, we did some big things together. That's great. Love to hear it. Compromise markets, uh, compromise moments between partners to get through, so we can sell some product. Uh, key message. I love it. I am curious. I want to bounce back to your time at Underwriters Laboratory. I sort of think of those as the guys that make sure my house doesn't burn down. But I know from our pre-call that there's a lot more to it than that. And in fact, it brought you into contact 
with that retail world again and sort of this, uh, you know, collaboration across different partners and providing sort of a breadth of services. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's kind of, kind of interesting learning about this almost very much under the radar part of the consumer electronics ecosystem. Yeah, no, that, that was actually, that was a really fun time for me. Um, and this was the time when I got into more of that business development, relationship building side of things. But, you know, again, I still had in the back of my mind, I had that marketing viewpoint. I kind of, I still kind of approach things from that perspective, but yeah, what, what I did there on that, on that particular team at UL is you're, you're exactly right. There's, there's certain certification testing that has to be done to your point, making sure that, um, you know, you're, you're not going to catch fire of your electrical device. But at, at the same time, UL also has these programs to where they're doing performance testing. And ultimately, that just comes down to think of a, a, a retailer. And, and I still worked with Best Buy there. I still worked. Um, I actually did some things with QVC. I, I actually you know, did some work with Costco. There's a number of retailers that I worked with. Lowe's Home Improvement was another one, actually. But so let's let's use Lowe's I, just as a quick example. And so they're bringing a you know, a private label product to market. They're, they're, they're bringing one of their, their branded dishwashers or actually even Best Buy did the same thing. I did some programs there. So whether it's a dishwasher, a, a clothes washer, um, you know, large appliances, we all, we all know what those are. And not only do they of course need to make sure that the safety certification testing is done, the regulatory testing that's required is done, but they also want to make sure that those products perform well versus the big brands out there, LGs, the Samsungs of the world. And so we would do prom um, campaign, uh, not campaigns, we would do testing programs with them to make sure that their white good, their private label product performed just as well as the large national brand. And so we really were, were you know, working extremely close to make sure that the product was safe first and foremost. Secondarily, it was per it performed extremely well. And to this day, um, I can still kind of carry that with me and that I can, I, I like to walk into retailers look at their private brand goods. I like to see what they've done from um, not only their safety and regulatory testing, but also just there's just seeing what they've done to, to make sure that their product is of a good and great quality. You know, the, the large national brands put out great products. They're, they're big national brands for a reason. So there's a, there's a long history and credibility to that. But at the same time, some of the best products you can find out there today are, are private brand goods. And so uh, anyway, that was that was a really interesting opportunity. I, I got to work with some some PhDs and and just really smart people in the room and people that were could really tear down a product and build it from the ground up and, and really help the retailers understand what they need to change or modify in order to make that product just a little bit better or a lot better. And uh, it was it was a, it's a really great uh, world class organization at, at UL. And I, I really enjoyed that time. That's really interesting. It. it certainly gives a lot of credence to the idea that, you know, you can create an ecosystem, put a product together, you know, through a variety of channels. And at the end of the day, right, it means there's going to be better products out there in the marketplace. And as consumers, we all win. I think the other lesson that I take away from from that answer is the consumer electronics world is a small world. Like you've, you know, you've worked at all these different places and you end up kind of continuously touching the same players in one format or another. And so, um, you know, got to be a very fun club to be a part of and, you know, one that obviously continues to show great promise for the future. And so um, what, a, what a great story that is and, and something I had honestly never heard of or thought about. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, well, we've got a few minutes left. Let's jump forward to E&Y. Uh, we've all obviously heard of the accounting firm or accounting side of that business. I think a lot of us are probably aware there's huge consulting arm attached to it. But, you know, unless you work at a large organization that's engaged in E&Y, you know, maybe a bit of a mystery to some of the audience. And I'll put myself in that in this bucket as to exactly like what are the kinds of things and deliverables, you know, that, that comes out of an E&Y consulting. I know you're on the Alliance partner side, so it gets even more opaque for me. And so just tell us a little bit about like what you know, what are the kinds of things that e &Y, what kind of solutions is e &Y delivering? Like who's, who's the kind of client and, and how do you take a huge consulting organization and even marry it to an alliance partner? Like what, what do these joint solutions look like? Just paint a picture so we can, you know, so me and the rest of the audience can have a framework for, for what those things look like and how they're impacting brands and us as consumers. Sure. No, it's, 
you know, and I and I use the word I use the word um, world class earlier, and, and AY is exactly that. It's a world class organization that has a very strong heritage, and it's it's it does so much work on the back end that that we as consumers or or you know business entrepreneurs or whatever may not even realize. But the the, the area kind of where I get involved in is I I have the 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 pleasure and the opportunity to work with some large you know, to work with a large technology uh, solution provider, um, one of the things that we're working on is sustainability solutions. And so, you know, what does all this mean? So we think of EY as a, you know, a traditionally an audit type of firm, but the reality is what EY really brings to the table are its expertise in business insights, its consulting uh, opportunity, consulting expertise, its ability to help businesses run better. And so with that, you, you take an EY and you partner it with a, with a large technology provider that brings software solutions and, and data management and all that. You take all that and you put that together. And, you, and you know, one thing that we're, we've worked on in the past is around sustainability in civil infrastructure, right? So now you can obviously tell I've gone from a consumer product side of things into more of a B2B professional services side of things, big, big learning curve, which has been fun. So far, I've only been there a few months, but it's been a really fun journey thus far, and I, I can't wait to see what we do. But think of it as I'll, I'll give one example. So think of a um, think of a large you know a suspension bridge or something like that. And I, I kind of shared some of this with you before, but it's kind of an interesting story. Think of a large suspension bridge, and you know, in the world of sustainability, it's all about um, you know taking things in civil infrastructure world like that and helping to elongate, extend its life because you know when you think of all the you know, you think of all the carbon footprints of all these things and all, you know, these things that we hear about today. Uh, if we're able to extend the life of an asset versus actually replace that asset, that is a very, you know, sustainably focused initiative. So, you know, in, in a large suspension bridge, perhaps you have to do some inspections of that. And if it's, you know, if it's a, you know, massive bridge that's, you know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile long, and you're putting repellers and climbers, you know, people that are that are repelling on this bridge, they're inspecting it, they're looking for weaknesses and areas that need to be, you know, repaired or maintained or whatever. That takes not only a, a tremendously long period of time, it's very expensive, there's safety elements, all those types of things. So one way that you could, you could, um, you know, make that a more sustainable offering is getting into the area of, of data using drones to scan that bridge, to look for those weaknesses, to look for those areas that, that need uh, care and, and to be looked at. And the, to go from you know putting a team of repellers and climbers for months on end, looking over and over uh, on a bridge, and by the time they finish, they have to start it over, to now only, almost being able to look at it in real time, right? With robotics, with drones that are out there scanning and you know they have their cameras and their x-rays, all those things they can do, that creates a more sustainable type of opportunity, right? Or sustainable um, environment. And so those are all, those are some of the areas I'm kind of getting into. I, again, I'm, I'm only, this is the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to get to work with quantum scientists in, in areas of quantum computing. And, and as little as I probably know, because I don't have an expertise in that field, just hearing about some of the things and opportunities that this can unlock in the future is absolutely exciting. And, um, you know, again, at the end of the day, what we what we try to achieve at EY is, you know, we, we talk about asking better questions, we come up with better answers, and we want to build a better, you know, a better world. And so that's really what everything we do is around is around data management. We hear so much about AI; that's a buzzword today. We're we're working in that space. So just lots of fun, exciting things. But uh, yeah, being on the B two B side has been a, a an interesting transition and one that I'm uh, really just kind of looking forward to seeing where it goes. Well, no doubt you'll do a great job at it, and um, that's a very exciting place to be. That 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 anecdote about uh, the sustainability and extending the life and the efficiency of maintaining bridges. I mean, right, we're, we've got a trillion dollar infrastructure uh, investment going on in the country. We're all trying to figure out sustainability, and so the the ability of an ENY to be nimble and to go into those areas that so need innovation and and are so ripe. Uh, and there's so much value to be pulled out of that is is highly compelling. So can't think of a better example to illustrate, you know, what the opportunity is and, and how you guys are pursuing it. So all the best with that. So most of your career has been spent in consumer marketing at all these electronics companies. Now you have shifted over at ENY to business marketing. Can you talk about how that shift has been for you? Yeah, it's um, it's 
it's been fun. Uh, definitely been challenging. Uh, the, the learning curve is pretty, pretty steep, as you could probably imagine. But what I've kind of taken away from that is, you know, I don't know, three quarters, 80 percent of my career has been in the consumer goods, consumer electronics side of things. And now that I'm on the B2B side, that's been something I've really had to think about a lot and how to take those skills and what's transferable into, into the other side, if you will, to B2B. And, and when I interviewed with, with EY, they actually told me that they were interested in me bringing some of those ideas from the consumer space into the B2B side. And, you know, how could those be applied? So we're, we're having some conversations. Is it, you know, influencer marketing, what should we be doing there um, and, and other things. But, but ultimately what I bring with me and, and, and it's, it just kind of grounds me is that, you know, you, you have to understand your, your value proposition. What is your what is your main core message that you're trying to get out there? It's what we do, you know, at, at the end of the day as marketers, finding that audience, making sure you're speaking to them authentically in a voice that they want to hear and learn. And, you know, again, it's just that credibility. If you go out there and say something completely off the wall and they're not ready for that that's not going to resonate well. And so the ultimately it's just, what is my message? Who is my audience? How do I reach them using those vehicles? You know, perhaps in the past I was doing social media marketing in, you know, with, with Instagram or Snapchat or, or whatever. We weren't doing TikTok when I was at Lenovo on the consumer side, but, um, but now I'm doing more so some in Twitter, but, you know, using LinkedIn a lot. Right. So again, it's just really understanding what's my message. Who's my audience? How do I reach them? and coming with that authentic message that's relevant to them. And then just trying to start that conversation and then, uh, you know, try, trying to create leads and opportunities to, to really um, just start that conversation, like I said, and, and then go from there. So marketing is pretty simple uh, if you really break it down to what you do in that job and whether it's on the consumer or B2B space, it's really the same. Uh, you just have to change out those few variables and, and go from there. Love that you hit on one of the real themes of the podcast, which has been as people move from industry to industry, it actually turns out to be a great thing versus a hard thing because you stick to first principles, but you cross germinate the best ideas that you've had at different places and you figure out how to reapply them in new ways to the new context. And so that's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And sometimes they work and sometimes they fail miserably. And that, that's the other thing is that, you know, as marketers, you know, we always hear that term, you know, if you're going to fail, fail fast. And, and there's some relevancy to that, obviously. But, you know, we have to constantly be learning. Look at the data. Look at the results. What are the adjustments in real time on, on that campaign? Um, what are the things I need to do completely different the next time we do a campaign? And so it's just that constant learning uh, is, is critically important as, as marketers. And so uh, just just taking that all that into account. And, uh, you know, putting your best foot forward. And sometimes, yeah, we fail miserably. I have stories in that regard, too. But uh, we just got to keep moving and uh, you, you'll succeed more times than not. All right. As we come in toward the close, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you were mentioned by Tiffany Mako as, um, as the mentor that had done the most for her in her career. Can you pay that forward and tell us about somebody who had a big impact on your career? Yeah, and, and and you know, for Tiffany to say that, I, I'm I'm grateful for that. Um, she she was she was great to we worked together at Lenovo and for a few years, and then we've you know gone our own professional ways. But you know, she she was a great employee and and just somebody to work with, and she had such great ideas. And so um, you know, I'm really excited to see where her career goes. But you know, I I've always had that feeling that you know we it's important we always hear about right people they don't leave they don't leave companies, they leave managers, right? I mean, that's because that's very personal. And, and I've been very, very fortunate to, to work with some great mentors and managers over the course of my career. I mean, there, there's a, I, I could write you a list, you know, mile long of them, but um, what I just remember when I went back to Lenovo. And so I, I went for, um, went to work for a, my manager. Her name was Patricia Bauer. Um, and she was, you know, she, she really was instrumental in, in really kind of helping me to, to, jumpstart that career back at Lenovo and to do some really bigger things that I had done in the past. Um, you know, I, I had, you know, my first tenure at Lenovo, I, I, there was a big area opportunity of growth for me. And then, as I mentioned, I left and did some other things at some of these other organizations. But when I came back, um, I was kind of, I'll say I was kind of recruited back in by some former colleagues. They said, Hey, this, this position's come back open, ironically on the North America retail team. So it was kind of going back to home for me. And, and so from a resume perspective and from a, 
having the chops, if you will, to do the job. I think that was all kind of taken care of by people who said he done this job before. He knows what he's doing. He's got the relationships and all that. So, so anyway, the, the kind of the funny story is um, when I went for my, my interview, one of my final interviews, and um, I was going in to meet with Patricia, and she'll laugh, I've told her this story, so she'll laugh at it. We only, we, she's very busy. We only had a you know relatively short period of time, about 30 minutes to meet. I, I, I go to the, I go to the campus, go to, go, you know, get escorted up to the, um, to the uh, conference room, and she's about 10 minutes late. And I'm like, okay, that. That doesn't, I don't know how I feel about that. I, I don't know her at the time, right? So I'm like, well, she's 10 minutes late. Okay. Well, she comes in absolutely pleasant, and, and we had a great conversation for about 10 to 15 minutes, and um, she leaves five minutes early. And I'm like, wow. You know, I have a 30-minute interview, 10 minutes late. She leaves five minutes early. It was an absolutely great conversation, but I wasn't really sure where this was going. Back in my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe she's already got somebody in mind she's going to hire. And as, you know, History is history. I got hired, went back there, worked with her for for you know a few more years uh, when I went back. But she told me later, she said, as soon as we started having the conversation, she said, I knew I was going to hire you. And and the reason why is obviously, again, she knew my background. She knew I was recommended by others. She said, I knew I was going to hire you because you brought your energy. You brought your authentic self. And she said that was the connection that she needed to understand that I was going to be a great fit for the team. I could do the job. What I didn't know, I could learn, right? I, I was a you know, relatively senior in my career and all that, but she gave me that opportunity based on that connection, that conversation, understanding that I would be a good fit for her team because the last thing she wants to do is put somebody that's not be, going to be a good fit for the totality of her team in there and have it start to break down from the inside out. So she, she gave me that opportunity and, and she really helped me to develop over those, those couple of years that when I was back at Lenovo and and I feel like I was able to just kind of go to a different level. She gave me the opportunity to do some other things I'd never done in the past. She knew that it's important to to take seasoned, uh, you know, professionals that have done kind of done the job before and they know what they're doing. Give them new opportunities to grow. And she 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 kind of launched me and pushed me into some, you know, we had a relationship with Universal Music Group. We did some really kind of pop culture type of things, more influencer marketing. And it was just an area that really kind of opened my eyes to other facets of marketing that I had not been into as of yet. And uh, those were some of the best experiences, projects, programs that uh, I was able, ever able to do in my 20 plus year career. And I, and I have her to thank for that. And again, it was she taught me a lot in those in those couple of years. And I, I can't thank her enough for it. What a great story. I have not met Patricia, but I feel like I definitely want to at this point. She is like an HR whisperer. It was a similar story that Tiffany uh, told in her session about how Patricia sized her up in what seemed like about two minutes and then made this gut call that it turned out to be prescient in terms of building a great team and identifying talent. So, um, yeah. so that is she's really, great. She's really good at that. And she might be somebody you might want to bring on, but uh, the, the reality is, is that, uh, yeah, she, she's extremely smart but it has a way of understanding people and, and, you know, recognizing how to put a team together based on those personalities, based on the skills, based on the drive and the motivation. She's really good at motivating to, to get that little bit more out of you. Not because she, she wants to, you know, I need more and you know, that type of thing, but she she knows it's in you. And, and when we have that, those opportunities to kind of shine and put, and she would put us out there and give us the opportunity to present and to do big things, and that's very satisfying, right, from a career perspective. We all go to work to earn a paycheck, right? But at the end of the day, you need to find that enjoyment that kind of gets you going and motivated each and every day. And she, she's really, uh, and, I, and I've kept in touch with her, she's, she's just really good at, you know, doing that with her teams and uh, somebody that I, I hope you and others get to meet because uh, she, she's absolutely great. That's phenomenal. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for the time today. These were incredible insights, and I think one of the big lessons that comes away beyond all the insights around consumer electronics marketing is how small uh, and how human the consumer electronics marketing world is. And so for those of you in the audience who are either in consumer electronics marketing or would like to get into consumer electronics marketing, if you don't reach, if you don't know Kevin, I would highly recommend you reach out to him and get to know him and build that network because that is clearly uh, where things come around. Um, So again, thank you, Kevin for being on the show. Thanks everyone else for tuning in and listening. We will see you next week on Generation Influence. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. 
Hey, thanks for tuning in. New episodes of Generation Influence drop every Wednesday, so be sure to check us out and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can find information on next week's guest in the description below. Hope to see you then and there.